This is Jerry and Barbara Seymour, and it's our privilege tonight to be teaching on Matthew chapter 21, um, and we are being hosted by D Deliverance Revolution, and we appreciate uh, all the efforts of Pastor Nate to, to host us and make this possible. So uh, if you'll get your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 21, we'll uh, start right after we pray. Welcome to the Holy Ghost. And uh, you want to pray, Precious? Sure. Father, we thank you for the day that we've had. No matter what continent we live on, no matter what time zone we're in, you're there. And we cannot fathom that in our human mind, but we know that you are in every time zone, you're on every continent, Hallelujah. all at the same time. So, Father, as we gather from around the world, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will um, be with each one of us, open our hearts to receive, open our ears to hear, and remove the weights and the weariness of the day so that our spirit will not be distracted from this day. Forgive us of our sins. And we thank you, Father, for the blood that covers us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, so Austin's going to read for us. Uh, he's our first reader tonight. And he's going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21. He's going to read from verse 1 to including verse 6. Okay, Austin. Thank you. Okay, this is hallelujah scripture, so I'm going to try to uh, just read it. That's all. And, and when they came near to Jerusalem and came to Beth Fadji, mm -hmm. which is, uh, yeah, it's Beth Fadji, at, Mount, uh, at the Mount of Olives, then the Lord Jesus sent to Talmudim saying to them, which I guess Talmudim means disciples. Yes, sir. Uh, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and straight away you shall find a donkey tied and a colt with her loosened and bring them to me. And if anyone says whatever to you, you shall say, the Adon, like Adonai, needs them, and immediately he shall send them. And all this took place that it might be filled what was spoken by the Nabi, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, which I guess is Zion, See, your sovereign is coming to you, meek and sitting on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the Talmudim disciples went, and having done as the Lord Jesus ordered them. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Perfect. So um, here we recognize, and, and we're always careful to, to uh, talk about where uh, Jesus was, where the scripture is talking about. So uh, Jesus uh, was making his approach to Jerusalem uh, probably the last time, and uh, he was uh, coming up from the Kidron Valley of, of Jericho, and uh so it was quite a hike uh, in elevation change up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is positioned on top of a mountain. And uh, it doesn't matter which direction you come, you're walking uphill. Uh, it's on a high, high mountain plateau. Um, and so he comes by the Mount of Olives. And uh, we know that when, uh, according to prophecy, that when Jesus returns, 
that that will be the place that his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives. But the, what I would really caught my attention is uh, the next part. Then Jesus sent, S-E-N-T, two disciples. So I, I went and looked up this word sent and uh, in Strong's Concordance in the Greek, and it actually means apostle, the, the sent one. It means, uh, so Jesus had not, uh, we, we, we really don't see the disciples uh, acting as apostles, but the word here in Greek means the disciples were apostled. They were sent out. They were uh, to accomplish. So this Greek word means sent out by an authority to accomplish a specific event to say a specific thing at a specific location. And that's exactly what these disciples were do. They were sent under the authority of Jesus to a specific location to accomplish a, a specific thing. And the, my question is, have you been apostled? Are you, are you still a disciple or have you been sent yet? So uh, let's look at, uh, who's going to read? Uh, John 17, that Melissa. would be Melissa. Melissa, could you read? Uh, so if everybody would uh, keep your finger on uh, Matthew chapter 21 and flip over to John 17, verse 18 and 25. It's to your right, three books, to your right. Ready? Yes, please. Okay. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Okay, that's 18. 25. Yes. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you, that you have sent me. Okay. So, uh, Melissa, can I ask you a question? Uh, in your Bible, is is there uh, is that written in red? No, it's a digital Bible. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but we know <clears throat> that Jesus said this. These are the words that came yeah. out of Jesus' mouth, and um, he is. This is actually his intercession and prayer to the Father for himself and for us. So. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, the Father sent Jesus to a specific place to accomplish a specific thing and gave him the power to do that. As I, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them, that's us, the disciples and those are apostles into the world. In verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you. I have known you and have. And these disciples have known you and that you sent me. So uh, when we see this word uh, back in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, that Jesus sent his disciples two by two. This is the second time that he sent his disciples out apostle them to accomplish and work under his authority. The first time was when he sent out 70 two by two, and they came back witnessing of the miracles that they had seen. And Jesus said, don't marvel about the, the, the miracles. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So uh, my question tonight is, are we sent? Jesus sent his disciples two by two. Are we sent? Just like Jesus prayed in John um, 17 that and, and asked the Father to, to bless us because the Father sent him and now he is sending us. Are we ready to accomplish what he has sent us to do? Are we ready to go and carry out this mission that uh, we have been studying about 
Are we ready? I hope I'm ready. And I'm excited about uh, accomplishing the things that, that, of the kingdom. Okay. Verse two. So as Jerry was hung up on the word sent. Oh, by the way, it, it occurs 680 times in the Bible. <laughs> as Jerry was studying the word sent, I, I have heard by a show of hands, how many of you have heard this story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem with the palm branches singing Hosanna? How many of you have heard this story before? Show, show of hands. You've grown up with this story. Okay. Well, I've always, I've grown up with it also. And I've always heard a donkey or a colt, but not a donkey and a colt. And I thought, wait a minute. Jesus is only one person. He can only ride one of them. Why two? Why a donkey and a colt? The other place that this triumphal entry is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Mark. And I'm, if I remember correctly, it's in the, the book of Mark chapter 11. It is. And there, only a colt is mentioned, not the donkey also. Mark 11, 15, if you're wanting there. So I, looked, I did some research on this donkey and colt business. And the prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling is in Zechariah, one of the minor prophets of the Old Testament, chapter 9, verse 9. Those of you who can find it, I'll give you, I think it's only like two books in front of, yes, it's only two, it's only two books in front of Matthew. So if you go to the left... You go Malachi, and then you're in Zechariah. So Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding a donkey. Wow. A colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah prophesied both the donkey and the colt. Now, what has been Matthew's biggest thing? As we've studied through Matthew, Matthew has focused on fulfilled prophecies. Over and over. Okay? So, here is the fulfilled prophecy in Zechariah. And Zechariah mentions both lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. So a foal of a donkey, huh? 400 years prior to this event, Zechariah Zachari, prophesied. If that is not confirmation that the word of God is true. There you go. Matthew has gone over and over and over. How many times has he said, and this was done to fulfill what was said previously? So, so the Jews... Probably, they probably had the minor um, prophets. prophets. Yes, they did. But they definitely had the books of Kings. So, Esther, would you please read 1 King 133? 1 King 133, 1 Kings, in the beginning, the first couple chapters, is all about David anointing Solomon to be <laughs> king, to take, taking over the kingship of the Israelites. So if you'd read First uh, Kings chapter 1, verse 33. Esther on the end. And the king said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, and also read verse 40. Sorry. All the people went up after him, while the people 
were playing on flutes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the ground shook at their noise. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of noise. But this is ex almost the exact same picture in First Kings of Solomon going through the city of Jerusalem on a donkey and people shouting and proclaiming and rejoicing that King Solomon, uh, long live King Solomon. They were doing very similar with Solomon, what they were doing with Jesus, the Messiah. Come on. So Solomon was put on, kings were put on donkeys in the Old Testament instead of horses. And this was his, was their symbol it, it was their practice it was their practice right so there was a hebrew word anointed uh that became a technical term for the lord's anointed and is usually with royal connotations and the title usually was translated as messiah so although solomon received god's promises to david those promises were not fully realized until the coming of Jesus. So Jesus is also uh -huh, fulfilling the fulfillment of King Solomon as being king in Jerusalem as well. As the son of David. As the son of David. Yes. Wow. Amen. That's, but that's good stuff, Barbara. There's also another indication here that one of the commentaries that I read says that they took the colt and the donkey because it was prophesied that Jesus would ride a colt that had no that no one had ridden before. Right. He would be the first one to ride it. That's so, in verse five, by the way. So a foal of a donkey is a colt that is still nursing. It still depended upon its mother. Remember, we talked about little children in the chapters previous that it wasn't little children is the size of the people but it was little children that are dependent on someone greater to take care of them amen so here jesus is getting ready to be on a colt a foal of a donkey still nursing from his mother as an indication that the donkey that the colt is still dependent upon its mother dependent upon someone greater than the donkey is so Jesus is getting on what a little child. Uh, I mean, it's it's the same. It's a parallel. It's not the same, but it's a parallel. The colt is a small nursing child. Jesus told us to become as little children. The colt, the full of a colt is dependent upon his mother. The little children in the New Testament parables are dependent upon our Heavenly Father. Does that make sense? That's good. Shake your head if it does. Thumbs up. Okay. So yeah, verse five, the, look at verse five. It says that your king is coming to you lowly. Lowly. And not on a, not on a stallion, not in a chariot, not, uh, but he is coming in the fashion of King Solomon fulfilling the scripture lowly and sitting on the coat foal of a donkey. And the triumphal entry is clearly a symbolic act that Zechariah 9 9 was recognized as the messianic, recognized as messianic by Jews, and the shout Hosanna Whoa, to the son on. of David, as well as spreading of their cloaks on the ground, indicating that the crowd recognized Jesus' claim to be Messiah. So it was at this point unmistakable that Jesus was. Except who he said he was, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, the Son of God. And the crowds of Jerusalem accepted him as the Messiah Amen. and welcomed him in uh, to such an extent that they took off their coats. And uh, one of the references says they took their talit. They took their talit. Where is she? Uh, Esther. They took their prayer shawls and laid them on the ground. Uh, and on the 
Colts back. On the Colts back. And uh, so as evidence that they were uh, fulfilling scripture. So I just thought that was incredible that, yeah, they took, they took their, their robe off, but then it says they took their prayer shawl and laid it on the coat and placed Jesus on the coat. So that, uh, here we see the fulfillment of all their dreams and aspirations, the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. And uh, it says that, and, and all of Jerusalem was agitated to the point that there was a trembling excitement in Jerusalem. Kind of sounds like when Solomon came in, in the city. The whole place was tore up. They were uh, celebrating. Everybody in Jerusalem uh, at that point probably had an occup uh, occupancy of about uh, 1.5 million. But since it was Passover, it would be more than double, close to 5 million people in and around the surrounding area of Jerusalem trying to crowd into the temple. And they were tore up. It was not just a parade. It was verge, right on the verge of rioting. And uh, the place was excited and agitated. Kind of goes back to what we talked about in Matthew 1 when the wise men came in and everybody in the city knew from Herod all the way down to the scribes and the Pharisees knew that the wise men were in the city. And now, much to the same parallel, the place was rocking. Next. Alana, you would like to read 7, verse 7 through 11? Hang on just a second. We've got to talk about what uh, Hosanna means. Before she reads it? Have we not? We haven't read that. I okay. She was going to read it. Please do. I wish you would. Yes. And brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds were getting ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Very good. You want to teach on Hosanna? Yeah, you, you're hitting it. All right. Here we go. Verse 9. So we talked about them uh, stripping the palm trees and um, the, the tradition of using the palm branches uh, is, goes way back. And uh, we don't do that much today. But uh, they were they were making a parade route, and uh, they were clearing clearing any obstacle so people could see, and they were putting these palm branches down and uh, making the road uh, for Jesus. It's it's interesting. Can we go back to the donkey just a minute? Jesus Jesus probably had to raise his feet up. He would sit in side saddle. On, on this donkey, and he probably had to hold his feet up. This donkey's coat was so short, couldn't, and it, it just, I just can't get over this, this parade and this event uh, of the Messiah coming in lowly, humbly, uh, making no fanfare but the crowd grabbing onto this and recognizing that Jesus was their Messiah and the uh, the one who was going to uh, in their mind relieve them of the Roman oppression so we get to verse 9 and the crowds were ahead of him and and following him and in front of him and behind him they were saying Hosanna uh, but you had a different definition of... Um, yes. Um, I also found that Hosanna 
is a Hebrew expression that means save now. So save now, save us. How many times have we cried out to Jesus, save me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, save me. Well, that's basically their uh, tone is they were wanting relief. Right. They were wanting relief from the Roman uh, oppression. And they were recognizing. Mm -hmm. Who was going to give it to them. Right. Jesus, the son of David. But riding, not in the way they wanted it. No. They, <laughs> they didn't expect. They didn't have the full story yet. At, at, but at this point, uh, and, and throughout the rest of this day, uh, and everything we're going to talk about in Matthew chapter 21 probably happened in one day. And so uh, we're getting uh, minute by minute. Uh, narrative on Jesus coming in and they called him uh, Jesus, son of David, Hosanna, the Messiah. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, uh, favored um, by the most high heaven. They entered Jerusalem. The place was rocking and uh, then like Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Here at verse 11, we hear the response of the crowd. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. But this is where things get to changing. Verse 12. Daytona? Dakota. Dakota. Daytona. Daytona. Dakota. That's a new nickname. <laughs> <laughs> So you're Jesus, going to read 12 through 16, please. Jesus cleanses the temple. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said, to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Okay. So I was wrong. Uh, this is two days because here in the next verse, we see that uh, in the morning, so, uh, chapter 21 encompasses more than one day. All right, here we go. Uh, so Jesus enters the temple. And uh, there was commerce going on the, in the temple. So the, uh, those who ran the temple decided that they could not use the money of the local, uh, the local people. They had to have special money. They had to have sanctified money. They couldn't use regular Roman money or, or regular Jewish currency. They had to have temple coins. They had to have temple money. And temple money left never left the temple. You could only use, you could only spend the money in the temple. And the only place you could get the money to spend in the temple was in the temple. So uh, it didn't matter how good your sacrifice was or how pretty your heifer or lamb or, or uh, doves. You had to buy the sacrifice. So they, they, were, they were ripping the people off. They uh, charged them exorbitant exchange for the Jewish money, for the temple money. And then they overpriced the animals because uh, it, it, was just, it was just a ripoff. It was a racket. And they made it difficult for the common person to bring their sacrifice and worship because sacrifice is all about worship. And... They were getting in the way of people worshiping the Father. And this did not go over well with Jesus at all. Uh, uh, another, now, according to uh, other uh, places in the Bible, this is not the first time that Jesus did this. 
uh, there's evidence that he did this at least twice, that he went in the temple and turned over all the uh, exchangers of money we see in verse 12. And then he very loudly proclaimed that uh, the scripture says, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And that's in Isaiah 56, verse 7, <clears throat> and in Jeremiah 7, 11. <clears throat> so he threw out the money changers. He threw out and, and totally disrupted all currency so that uh, for this Passover, there were only sacrifices brought in from the people and they weren't brought and sold uh, at the money changers. So Jesus is making a way for people to get to, to the Father. Jesus is making, can we see that he has eliminated all, uh, he is eliminating roadblocks, making a way for the common people to come in. It wasn't, it was, he was aggravated at the people who ran the temple, yes. Yes. And he was also aggravated at the, at the Pharisees and Sadducees um, because in verse, the end of verse 15, right at the beginning of verse 16, as they were, as he was healing people, the blind, the lame that were in the temple and the chief priests and the scribes were seeing these wonderful things that Jesus was doing. Um, and the children were singing praises to, to Jesus. But those who were in authority were getting indignant. What's that, uh, What's that mean? They were getting mad. Okay. They were getting upset. Right. Were they upset? Now, we could take this a couple different ways, and I haven't studied it out necessarily as to which is actual, but they could have gotten indignant because the focus was off of them. Mm -hmm. They could have gotten indignant because Jesus was doing miracles, and they weren't doing miracles. They they probably prayed for people. They did. They had uh, yeah. religious services. Sure. Their people weren't getting healed, but Jesus comes along. Everybody's happy. He's here. Uh, they're singing songs to him. They're calling him the Messiah. They're calling him the Messiah. How can that be? He, and they're going, what, what, what are we, chop liver? So they are, the people in the pr prominent positions are indignant about what's going on with Jesus and about what Jesus is doing and the response that the people are giving Jesus. Now this teaches us one thing. You know who is a true believer, a true follower of Jesus, someone who's really lifting up Jesus, who does not get indignant when the focus is taken off of them. When Ooh. someone else is doing healings, when someone else is praying for people and they're getting healed, and someone else in leadership, you know, may not be getting all the attention. And that if they don't get indignant about me praying for people mm -hmm. and getting healed, then they're a true leader. Right. That's good. Because we're all equal in the body of Christ. All service is equal in the kingdom. That's right. I see Miss Barbara shaking her head. She likes that. I can talk about that. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so when the scribes and the Pharisees in verse 15 came and they saw all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing and the children and were proclaiming and prophesying, they came and said to Jesus, uh, can you believe what they're saying? Can uh, are, are you going to tolerate this? Are you, uh, Jesus, uh, do you hear what they're saying? <laughs> Oh, man. And Jesus replied to them, out of the mouth of babes and the unweaned infants, you have perfected, perfected praise. Perfected praise. 
perfected praise. Hallelujah. So that's children give the most perfect praise because it's out of a pure heart. That's good. It's out of a pure heart. They're not doing it because they think they're going to get something. They're doing it because they love Jesus. They're having a good time. Children just play because they love to play. They sing because they love to sing. They praise because they love to praise. We teach them. Adults teach them how to be unchildlike. Oh, my God. We <laughs> teach them fear. We teach them judgment. Okay, so Jesus prophets uh, 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 quoting out of Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, out of the mouth of babes and unweaned infants, you have established and perfected uh, strength you, that you might silence the enemy Come and, on. And the avenger. You Come see, on. See, it is the practice. Uh, and Jesus did this all through his ministry uh, that he would reference a place and expect them to, to know what he was talking about. To know and, the rest of it. And he said, haven't you heard? Haven't you read? <laughs> Surely you know the scripture. So he didn't quote the whole thing. But let's, let's look at what he did quote. He was quoting Psalm 8. And so out of the mouth of babes and unweaned infants, you have established strength because <laughs> of your foes that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. So they didn't have nothing to say. So those of us, those who are struggling with oppression, struggling with demonic oppression, things like that, if we praise, praise. we silence the avenger. Because Satan was a assigned to praise and worship that was his job in heaven before he fell so when we praise and step up into his place and bring worship to to the father he can't stand it that's right he can't stand it. he's got to leave that's right he's got to leave he cannot inhabit where praise of god is emanating from that's right that's right out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have perfected praise Jesus says right here in verse 16. Then, Andrea, are, are you ready to go on or no? Oh, verse 17. And they, and leaving them, he departed and went to his hometown. That's where he stayed so many nights he spent in Bethany. So he, he went, went downhill all the way down to Bethany and spent the night there. So guess what? In the morning, he's got to climb the mountain again. And you know that was three thousand feet up to Jerusalem. It's a hike. Yeah, it is a hike. A, a three thousand foot elevation change from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now Bethany wasn't quite that low, uh, I don't but know. the anyway, yes, it is. It, it's no small feat to hike to the top and, and from uh, the surrounding cities up to Jerusalem. So we're going to talk about his his walk up to Jerusalem. Yeah. Andre, you've got your camera off. Are you still available to read Matthew 21? Is, isn't, isn't that area too like a desolate, like desert too as well? You're correct. Back then, I know now, now, now it's flourishing, but back then it was probably arid, right? Very much more arid than now. You're exactly right. How are you doing, Andrea? She might be taking care of the kids. Okay. okay. I'll read it. Um, so we're at verse 18 of chapter 21 of the book of the Gospel of Matthew. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. Come on, preach. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you again and immediately the fig tree would have been died amen and when the disciples saw it they marveled saying how did the fig tree wither away so soon so jesus answered and said to them assuredly i say to you if you have faith and do not doubt you will not only do what was done to the fig tree 
But also, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Hallelujah. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Okay. So, uh, so the next morning, he got up and was making a hike back into the city. And verse 18 tells us that he was hungry. Okay. Uh, I, I, this is lets us know that Jesus was in a body just like us. He had to have water. He had to have food. He got tired. He had emotion. And uh, Jesus, yes, was uh, the son of God in a human body. So he was sinless, but yet he was, he struggled with everything that we have in our mortal body. Uh, he got tired and he was hungry on the way up the trek back to Jerusalem. And uh, so the first thing we noticed in verse 18 is that Jesus saw a single fig tree that was leafed out and it was uh, above the roadside. So he had, he had to detour off of the road to get to this tree. And it was a fig tree. The Passion Translation... I know for sure, says that the, there was a lone fig tree. One, a single lone fig tree. And the Amplified Bible says that too. Oh, so, uh, Jesus made an effort to go to this one tree, expecting something to, to uh, I mean, he didn't go to look at it. He went to get something to eat. And he went... And made the detour up to this tree. And verse 18 tells us, uh, when he got there, he found nothing. And it it didn't go well for the fig tree either. That's right. So, um, first of all, we need to see what the reference is to a fig tree. Because uh, this is another parable. This is a parable that Jesus enacted rather than he spoke it out. He actually acted it out. He did this parable. He did it. He enacted this parable as uh, an illustrated sermon, you might say. He gave, he walked it out instead of speaking it out. Okay? Go with me on that? Uh, so the all through the Old Testament, uh, Earth Kings, uh, Micah, Zechariah, all use the uh, fig tree as symbolism uh, of the prosperity of Israel. And the, the, the fig tree represent fertility. It represented peace and prosperity. And uh, the, the hope and the vision of that prosperity was seen as a man sitting on it, under his fig tree, his own fig tree, and drinking and eating the fruit of his own vine. So when Jesus uh, enacted acted out this parable, the fig tree is Israel, is the nation of Israel. So we can see that the fig tree, uh, I grew up with fig, fig trees in, in my dad's yard, and uh, fig trees are, are a very unique uh fruit bearing tree it bears two harvest every year and in the spring uh, the fig tree produces buds and small figs even before the it, it gets covered with leaves so it will produce small figs and then uh, as they are ripening then it starts producing figs and then later on at Big leaves. Thank you. And then later on in the season, uh, usually around June, uh, that was in South Mississippi, uh, in June, the uh, it would produce the uh, just a huge crop because the spring rains would plump up and and flourish the tree, and it would produce another harvest. That that's the one that we canned and and preserved and and collected and you had to pick the figs every other day because it was producing so many figs. So but, you're saying that the fig 
fruit would appear on the tree before the leaf came out. That's exactly right. The first That's crop. Very unusual fruit tree. Exactly. Uh, so with this tree, Jesus coming up to it, it had leaves on it. It had leaves on it. So, so Jesus you, expected there to be fruit because the leaves were already there. Come on, preach. But there weren't any. There weren't no fruit on this tree. There were plenty of leaves. It was well watered. It was not, it was not suffering. He saw it from a distance. He made the effort to go up to this tree and being hungry, getting it up to the tree, expecting to get something to eat, uh, finding nothing. And this, as far as I know, this is the only time throughout scripture that we find that Jesus pronounced a curse. You can research that and uh, you can, we'll talk about it next week, but I believe this is the only time that Jesus ever cursed anything, but he did teach us that we have the ability to bless and the ability to curse. And uh, so that's just side note. Jesus cursed the fig tree and immediately he cursed it because it didn't have fruit and immediately it died. But we want to uh, break open this parable and look and see what, uh, what the parable was that Jesus enacted and look at all the, the symbolic points of this. Well, I'm reading out of the expository's Bible commentaries, what I'm reading out of here. And you this, could read that backwards. Yeah. This is so profound. But it, it's saying, in light of the discussion on the relationship between the leaves and the figs, the leaves and the fruit, Jesus is cursing those who make a show of bearing fruit. Come on. But are spiritually barren. Come on. He's taking the fig tree and saying, look, you can't be like the fig tree and, and look like you're bearing fruit, but have no spiritual, um, but you're spiritually barren. People can look and make the appearance of bearing fruit for Jesus. But when the rubber hits the road, there's no fruit there. When you start looking at their lives, there's no fruit there. What does fruit when look you like? Go to, when you go with <laughs> them and say, I, um, will you pray with me? Or fruit looks like peace. Fruit looks like joy. Fruit looks like um, I've got a friend in long the, suffering. i got a friend in the nursing home. Will you go with me? We need to pray for this man and, and see him. I mean, he's, he's got... All the symptoms of COVID, and and I need for you to come go with me and and pray with me over this man. Does that well, would I, that be fruit? That not asking would be fruit, but if I responded, Harry, I'm so sorry about I'm so sorry about your friend. But look, I I've got to, I've got to go. I've got to go wait, take wait. care of my family. <laughs> That's not bearing fruit. Not bearing fruit, but looking very spiritual to someone for them to think that I was bearing fruit okay so Jesus is taking the fig tree and saying it looks like it has fruit but it has nothing to offer me we cannot be believers and look like we have something to offer people joy offer them peace in their struggle mm -hmm. offer to pray with them during a rough time of illness, without, but without following through in doing it. Absolutely. Okay. And, and coming with the authority as a sent one. Yes. Are we sent to accomplish these things that Jesus has, has given us the liberty to do? Are we willing to walk these things out? Amen. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Are we sent and can we deliver the fruit of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the city uh, or the nation of Israel is represented as the fig tree. So mm -hmm. how is it that they were not fulfilling and, and bearing fruit? Because, 
because they obviously had plenty of leaves. They looked like they had, they were promising the people uh, prosperity. They were promising the people the, all the religious acts of this is how, how you receive forgiveness. This is how you, you walk in right relationship with God. The chief priests and the scribes were, were not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus finds a full ad advertised piety without any fruit. So he curses. So not only were they not uh, walking in a fruitful relationship with God, but they were getting in the way of other people worshiping. Right. They, <laughs> they, they weren't bearing fruit, and they were, they were shaking the tree and knocking the fruit off that was there. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Jesus uh, walked out this parable in front of them and showed them. And, and these disciples obviously knew the scripture. They had the scripture. They, uh, Matthew, as he was writing this, probably was able to quote the Pentateuch and the first five books of the Old Testament. And so they, they, when he cursed the fig tree, it was like, oh, my Come on. But, but then what happened? Let's look. What happened when in verse 19, Jesus says, never again shall fruit grow on you and the fig tree withered at once. Wow. Immediately, Mark says, the disciples saw it and they marveled. And how is it this, this tree would wither from its roots at once. Jesus said, verse 21, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and firmly rely and trust, if you do not doubt, you can do this and even greater things to, uh, than this, than I've done to the fig tree. You can say to a mountain, and commentaries say, uh, actually, in Greek, it doesn't say mountain. It says uh, entire mountain range. That you can say to this mountain range, be taken up and cast to the sea, and it will be done unto you. Do you have faith? And do you believe? Are you willing to trust God and rely only on him? Then you can speak to the situation, and it shall be done unto you. The question comes back. Verse 1. Are you sent? Are you a disciple? And are you an apostle? Are you a sent one? Are you doing it as little children? Are you doing it with faith, out of joy, as little children? So uh, we're going to stop there tonight, and uh, we'll pick up there next week. And uh, I just want to uh, compliment uh, Miss Karen. She brought a question last week, Miss. Uh, Karen brought a question last week, and I am so excited because uh, she caused me to dig and find out the answer to that. So uh, hopefully we can get to that next week. But the answer uh, for uh, Ms. Karen, uh, the answer is in verse uh, chapter 23. And uh, so uh, please remind me when we get to chapter 23, and, and we'll talk about that question that you brought last week. That many are called and few are chosen. Right. So uh, we're going to close out in prayer here, and then we'll open up the uh, chat line for uh, questions and answers for about 20 minutes. So uh, we just want to thank everyone for, for coming tonight, this awesome group, and uh, listening. And uh, we pray and hope that the Holy Spirit has ministered to you and you saw something new that you've never seen before. And as we talked about Matthew chapter 21. So Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you have prepared the ground to receive the seed of the word of God. And Father, we just will position ourselves and we will grab onto this seed and we will accept the challenge, Lord, that you have sent us. You have washed us. You are discipling us. And Father, we accept the challenge to, to be sent. That we might bear good fruit. Yes. Father, so that people can be fed. That people can be refreshed. And people can be nourished. 
simply by receiving the fruit that we bear, the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. We cherish it and we cherish your word. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara and Jerry. If everybody will give them a pause, they can see your hands clapping, so show your appreciation. Barbara and Jerry do a lot of uh, marriage-type preaching, and they know the Bible, and they've been saved longer than most of us have been alive. Of course, their Barbara's only 39, so don't take that that she's old. She's not old. She's just been saved a long time. So with that said, if you're watching this video down the road, where there's four years from now or four days, uh, we want to make sure you know what salvation means, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. While we're all gathered here at 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, East Coast time, people from around the world, it's because we're fired up about the kingdom of Jesus Christ, or whether you need deliverance, or whether you need healing prayer, or just want to grow in Jesus, we want to make sure you jot down the website, deliverancerevolution.org. There's a link that says, contact us. Fill out the form. I will respond to you. I'll invite you to connect with us on Skype. I'll invite you to this meeting. We have other deliverance groups. We have a group every day at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We have a group on Wednesday night. We have this one on Thursday night. We have an intercessory prayer on Saturday so you can get completely engrossed in the kingdom and the word of God and deliverance and healing from A to Z. I'm talking about it, questions answered on fasting, praying, communion, giving the whole gamut, okay? So we like to think this ministry is the real deal, okay? So it's not religion, not just smoke and mirrors. There's also prayers on that website, very powerful prayers. So it's deliverancerevolution.org, contact us button, okay? We love you, we're praying for you. Thanks for joining us tonight. God bless you. Bye bye. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Fling wide these gates, let's see his kingdom come.